And uh, this is our next speaker, David. Yes, hi, good, good morning. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me uh, speak to you today. Sorry I haven't been around as much as I would like to. Uh, this week has been full of my children's Thanksgiving plays. And I've had to go and watch and be horribly proud and, uh, and come back. And it's been, it's, I'm sorry I live in the office of a Hugh Grant movie, I'm determined. But normally, at the end of a Hugh Grant romantic comedy, you know, he has to like leave the conference early or meet a, meet a plane to go and see the child sing and be cute at the Christmas play. This morning I did the opposite. I left the, kid, the Thanksgiving play early to come and be here. So I don't know what kind of dad that makes me, but it's probably not a huge grant. Um, anyway, so today I'm going to talk about connecting uh, uh, AGMs and star formation. Uh, this is work that I've done with my group here over the last few years. Uh, I'm not obviously going to talk about all those results. I'll just talk about a few things. Uh, so, of course, the motivation here is we know that supermassive black holes and our own galaxies seem to be correlated. Uh, and this... Um, to the batteries. So basically, this M sigma relations indicates that there's uh, correlated growth between the black holes and the host galaxies. And so by studying the evolution of AGNs, since both black hole mass gets grown through thin distribution of bright AGNs, hopefully you can learn a little bit about how this, uh, 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 these correlations uh, <coughs> take hold. So th the outline today is basically threefold. First, I'm going to talk about a uh, hypothesis of the connection between AGM activity and star formation, especially up at uh, redshift of about one, and talk a little bit about an analytical starburst disk model I've been working with the last few years to try to explore that uh, connection. And then, if there's time, towards the end, I'll talk about uh, evidence for two modes of AGM evolution, how the Seifert and Quasar regimes may be uh, distinct from one another. Uh, so, a lot of the evidence for AGM uh, evolution has come from uh, deep field surveys uh, by Chandra in this case, but also by Hubble and Spencer, all banging on the same parts of the sky so we can understand uh, uh, black hole growth up to high redshifts. So this is the 4 megasecond Chandra deep field sub image. Almost every single one of these dots is an AGN up to high redshift. And one of the interesting things about it is almost all of these uh, AGNs are obscured. Uh, they're hidden behind significant columns in their host galaxies. Um, and so that makes up the shape of, of the extra background. So most of the black hole growth is hidden to us. Uh, as you, know, you might wonder what's, what's driving that uh, obscuring region. Uh, the interesting thing is if you go and follow up those uh, uh, host galaxies of those AGNs and study their redshift distributions. Uh, most of those AGNs peak at around redshift of one or slightly less than one. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise, actually, because we knew prior to the launch of Chandra and XMM that quasars, which are the most luminous AGNs, uh, are mostly found at redshifts two or three, and it was expected the X-ray background would be dominated by these uh, quasars, just obscure versions of them. But rather, we find that obscured Seifer galaxies that are around redshift of one dominate, uh, produce most of the X-ray background. And they have much lower luminosity than quasars as well. So we're starting to see perhaps the sort of separation of, of source, sources that make up AGI activity. Now, redshift of one, where these obscured Seiferts seem to be most common, is an interesting time in the history of the universe. It's right where the uh, star formation rate density is reaching its peak and then it's starting to fall off. This is the latest plot I was able to find of the star formation rate dens density history uh, uh, using Herschel results. So there's a whole bunch of lines, but basically this uh, green swath here is the uh, latest total star formation rate density. And you can see it rises from redshift 0 to 1 uh, by nearly a factor of 10 before 
uh, only rising a little bit more in direction to two, and then maybe turning over or flattening off. So where all these obscured seepers are, are sitting, making up uh, the X-ray background light, is right around here, right where the uh, uh, star formation rate is starting to flood it off. So I've been interested in exploring uh, the following hypothesis that there exists an increase in obscured AGN from redshift 0 to redshift 1 that gives rise to this X-ray background population. And that increase is directly related to this increase in star formation rate in the host galaxy. That is, there is a connection between the obscuration around the AGN and the host galaxy star formation rate. And thus, of all, with redshift, basically the unified model that we all learned uh, as kindergartners of the orange torus around uh, a black hole accretion disk system isn't the whole picture, at least once you get out of the local universe. That, that orange donut is connected to the kitchen around the room, if you want to expand on that analogy. Uh, so the nice thing then is if you can study the obscuration zone up at these high wrenches, that might give you some connection between the galaxy environment and the black hole environment. So one immediate prediction of that hypothesis is that the obscured to unobscured ratio of AGNs, or the type 2 to type 1 ratio, uh, would evolve with redshift. And we studied the actual background back in, uh, uh, a long time ago now, and found that indeed that the type 2 fraction could go up as 1 plus z, that was hard, to the 0 0.3 and can fix the that the extra background will never pass. Uh, this was actually confirmed uh, by bigger samples in, in a few years with actually steeper increases in, in the type 2 to 1 ratio. And, and the latest work that just came out a couple weeks ago by Andrea Merloni uh, using a huge amount of Cosmos data also finds that the obscured AGN fraction as a function of redshift here in different luminosity bins uh, mm -hmm does show an increase uh, with, with redshift. So there does seem to be some connection between the, that the unified model is connected somehow to the host, ga host galaxy. It knows what uh, time it is in terms of the universe's evolution. But, but there's a problem. Pro would be a mass-appreciation rate effect? Uh, I mean, you breathe, you breathe more gas, therefore you evaporate the torus or what? Well, it actually should go the other way around. Yeah. But you would expect some correlation with, with how fast the galaxies grow uh, also. So why would it be only as far as that changes? Uh, um, so it's not just the star formation rate. You're actually <coughs> thinking gal galaxy mass or something like that? Uh, or how fast they grow. I mean, that's where most of the... Uh, so like specific goes. star formation rate or something like that. Um, I have to look at their paper but in more detail, but I think that I typically find uh, that it's not an easy function of that. And I'm actually going to go on to a big problem right now. Any other questions, though? All right. So, as the title says, wait just a second. It's not so easy. Because we can measure now, with Herschel data, the star formation rates in galaxies, <coughs> post galaxies of AGNs, up to high redshift, uh, say using the 60 micron luminosity of, of the host galaxies, and you can, you, know, you can measure the AGN luminosities using the X-rays. Up at 60 microns, the contamination from AGN dust heating is really minimal, so you know you're hitting mostly it's a star formation heating. And you find that basically uh, all, at almost every redshift bin here for sort of Seifert-like luminosities, there is no correlation between star formation luminosity and AGN luminosity. There is an increase in, uh, in star formation luminosity with redshift, just like all galaxies produce more stars at higher redshift. But it doesn't seem to be connected to what the AGN is doing, except maybe up at, in the quasar regime, up at high, uh, <coughs> high redshift, where you know there you're probably banging galaxies together. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, 
So the, these Herschel stacks and measurements of X-ray detected AGNs don't so show a relationship between AGN accretion and host galaxy star formation. And it even gets worse because you can then break that sample down and look at the star formation luminosity as a function of AGN obscuration. Now, if this, what we were saying before, if the star formation is somehow regulating the obscuration, then perhaps you should see more star formation with higher levels of X-ray obscuration. And here are two samples which basically sh show that this is false. Uh, here's, again, the 60 micron luminosity is a function of X-ray obscuring column at different redshifts. It's basically flat. Uh, here's, again, the Maloney et al. sample. This is plotted slightly differently. They took the mean star formation rate of the obscured guys divided by, by the mean star formation rate of the unobscured guys. Let me just finish my sentence. And then you can find that as a function of uh, luminosity here for all the redshift spins, it's basically flat. So maybe you'll get to this, but so this is, um, <clears throat> of course, in the atomic NH. Is there any inconsistency between this and the schmidt kennecott law, which is more molecular? Uh, as far as I'm aware, <coughs> star formation in even in these galaxies just follow, follows normal Schmidt sh Kennecott laws. So this is just obscuring line of sight column density, not surface density. And, well, that, that is surface density, but it was, I guess it's atomic hydrogen versus molecular. Is that the key difference? Um, well, it's it's going to be a total column along with lead site, it's usually interpreted as atomic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it would follow, it, they still follow the schmidt kennecott law. Mm -hmm. Yes? So am I right in thinking that this shows that there is no uh, coincidental correlation between AGN and star formation, but does not tell us something necessarily about one causing the other, but with a certain lag? Yes. So th there's always that. I mean, there's obviously a time lag that these studies can't can't look at. It. And there have been people like uh, Ryan Hickox who has tried to model basically the aging at variability, which change, can change a lot. And if you average that, you might and you assume that there's star formation rates correlated with that. But if you vary out, average out the aging at variability, you would sort of wash out any causal connection. So yeah, there is a possibility uh, that uh, a time delay would also wash out any connection. There is another problem, though, with over-interpreting this plot. And this is uh, the realization that these, this is galactic scale star formation. This is, these are partial measurements. So the beam is big. You're taking in most of the galaxy. Oh. And it, it's not necessarily uh, connected to maybe the circumnuclear environment. So how big is the angular resolution? Six uh, arc seconds. Sorry? Six arc seconds. Six arc seconds. So at 60 microns, it would be... There's no 60 microns, it's 70. Okay, so... Anyhow, but yeah. yeah, it goes scales to one of the wavelengths. So basically, you have to be at redshifts less than 0.05 to image a galaxy. Right. Well, I'm actually more worried. I know, I know that. But I'm more worried about a high redshift. You're going to see other galaxies within your. Yeah. You're going to measure an environmental star formation. That's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, is the second law one point nine yes. The ratio of the average star formation is type two AGN to type one AGN is something like eight square That's correct. Well, if you, it's more I'm interested in whether or not uh, the obscuration is connected to the star formation. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think what, what I'm going to focus in on is that you're actually just measuring the whole galaxy. <coughs> and what we're interested in is what's happening 1 to 100 parsecs away. So 
So for, for these studies, which you know probe the redshift rings we're interested in, interested in, uh, you're, we're not really getting to the physical conditions we're interested in, but we can do that at low redshifts. So now let's look at what low redshift studies show. So if you now go to local super galaxies and you use Spitzer uh, to take spectroscopy as a function of distance away from a, a local seafruit, and then you measure the PAH emission, which is a measure of star formation rate, and then you measure the O4 emission line in the infrared and convert that to an AGM luminosity and then into a black hole accretion rate. You find, again, on a galaxy scale, there's very little correlation between the star formation rate and the mass accretion rate on the black hole. But then as you get to, say, a kiloparsec scale or down to a 300 parsec scale, these guys at least find a very nice correlation between the star formation rate at 300 parsec level and the AGM accretion rate. And there's been an even closer study with uh, integral field units. Uh, again, these are all local secrets. Uh, and there's uh, different size scales for probing that shows a different color. The solid symbols are detections. The uh, open symbols are upper limits. And again, there's a general trend that on these size scales of tens to hundreds of parsecs away from the nucleus, uh, the star formation rate shown here is correlated with black hole mass accretion rate. Yep. Can you go back one slide? Yes. So what are they using oxygen for as an indicator of the AGN luminosity? Yes. For an AGN embedded in a star for in a star for Yes. So that strikes me as a little dangerous because oxygen four is not high enough at ionization that it cannot be produced by both stars. Right. Neon five is a much better indicator, but oxygen four can be found, say, in M eighty two. So there is a danger that there's like the one on the right. Right. Closed. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they try to calibrate it out as best they can, but looking at and these, it's always tricky looking at these regimes. Uh, these guys, I believe, use uh, both oxygen 4 and neon 5 to measure the uh, black hole accretion rate. So once you can get close to these tens to hundreds of parsec scales, there are indications now that uh, <coughs> star formation rate does go up with black hole accretion rate. Now, there's no, there's not enough good sample. That, again, these don't show that uh, the obscuration is necessarily higher in the high star formation rates, but it, it does at least show this connection. And maybe up a higher redshift where you have you know, more uh, higher gas fractions and more intense starbursts, nuclear starbursts, perhaps you can uh, bring that connection between obscuration and nuclear star formation together. And so that's what uh, I've been working on the last several years off and on, trying to use a, a physical model of a nuclear starburst disk to predict uh, both star formation uh, on these tens to hundred parsec scales and connections to the AGN uh, phenomenology. Ideally, uh, what the questions we want to answer are what properties are required in order for a disk to both fuel and obscure an AGN at the same time in terms of star formation rate, fueling rate, metallicity. Uh, how might this change with the host galaxy of evolution? How would the feedback from the AGN actually impact the structure of that nuclear starburst. And we have to consider also the effects that in this nuclear environment, the, the gas structure, the density is going to be very high, highly molecular as, uh, as well. And the radiation physics uh, are going to be important, especially if you want to connect to observ observations. So because I'm a simple man, I always begin with simple things. I started with a, a nice analytical theory developed by Tom Thompson in Clabbers, uh, 2005, where they looked at starburst radiation pressure supported starburst disks in the context of Eulards. So I scaled down that theory to try to understand more of AGNs. 
And this is sort of the uh, a quintessential nuclear starburst disk. I'll, I'll try to go through these lines in detail so you understand what the, what's going on here. Uh, basically, there's one of the fundamental assumptions of the theory is the Q parameter is always one. The star formation rate always adjusts, so Q is equal to exactly one everywhere for the function radius. It's a one-dimensional analytical model. Uh, the other thing is it's Eddington limited on dust. Dust is the major source of opacity because the densities are so high. So the infrared radiation pressure from the stars, all the starlight gets reprocessed into infrared, and the opacity of dust provides the vertical pressure support to keep the whole thing stable. Uh, we assume that there is also a global torque acting on the disk, perhaps caused by bars within <coughs> bars, or uh, spiral density instability that causes gas to slowly move through the disk, removing, uh, so there's some angle momentum transport. And basically what happens is that at every radius there's a competition between star formation and accretion. The gas is trying to accrete through the nuclear starburst to end on towards a, a nuclear uh, accretion disk under the black hole, but it keeps getting turned into stars. And at some point, the, all the gas either gets turned into stars or it can make its way through to happily fall into a black hole. And so look at the Scott side scale here. We're considering just around the 100 parsec. The black hole is probably way over here. Gas is fed here. This, the solid line is uh, the uh, star formation rate in units of solar mass per year. The dashed line is the mass accretion rate in units of solar mass per year. Gas gets fed into the uh, uh, outer radius here with a certain gas fraction. <coughs> stars start forming, but it's moving through. And then here, something interesting happens around one parsec. And the reason something interesting happens is shown by this dotted line, which is the opacity due to dust and gas within this disk. So it's very, very optically thick. This is very dense because it's embedded in an environment. Uh, but as you go to closer and closer and closer towards the center, the density rises and rises and rises. Things get hotter and hotter and hotter. And so you can see that this is gas temperature here, uh, the mid-plane temperature. Once you get to a certain radius, the temperature peaks over about 1,000 degrees. At that point, uh, dust can no longer su survive, it sublimates, uh, therefore uh, the opacity drops. And then you can see the drop there in the dotted line. Because we assume Q must always be 1, so because of this drop of opacity, uh, the star formation rate suddenly jumps up. And so you have this big burst of star formation uh, around uh, 1 to 2 parsecs. And because the effective temperature of the disk, which is roughly the surface temperature, is below 1,000 degrees, you get this uh, temperature gradient or opacity gradient vertically. And waving your hands magically, you can assume or suggest that this burst of star formation rate might puff up the disk vertically because of the uh, opacity gradient. This mostly uses up a lot of the gas, but some peak gets connected to some, presumably some accretion disk here to feed the black hole. So what I did was I took a whole pile of those type of models, and by a pile I mean nearly 1300, uh, and very basically there were you know, just several parameters like the size of the accreting black hole, the size of the disk, what its gas fraction is, how quickly gas can move through, and also the dust-gas ratio because that obviously affects the opacity. And since these are radiation pressure supported, the opacity is extremely important. And then I looked at you know, how frequently could I get one of these parsec scale starbursts, which presumably may obscure an EGM, up at like right check point eight, where, where we're interested in. And that radius turns out happily to be about uh, one to a few uh, parsecs. Uh, and that's interesting because that's where we sort of think the torus of the unified models seems to want to be for measurements on this order of uh, parsec. And we got about 40% <coughs> of these models produce these kind of parsecs. Now what kind of star formation rates uh, do you actually get in these, in these bursts? 
They're not ridiculously high. Almost over half of them actually have star formation rates less than 20 solar masses per year. The star formation rate densities, when you divide by the uh, surface area, are extremely high and, and actually do, you know, are corresponding to the very high gas surface densities. But the instantaneous star formation rates are, are not that extreme, maybe 20 solar masses per year, with 10 to the 30 being uh, the most common. Do you actually have a measurement of the gas surface density? I can, uh, I calculate that. Um, yeah, measure, you need things like CO. Yeah, actually, uh, I don't have a slide here, but we did a, a two papers looking at the CO properties of these things. Um, and they're at the rate at the top end of the Kenny Hutch Schmidt law because the surface densities are so high. And because they're actually Eddington and limited, you get uh, basically a linear slope. You predict a linear slope for the Kenny Hutch Schmidt law rather than a 1.4 slope. Um, and, uh, but CEO is actually really bad for these because the densities are so high. CO is just basically everywhere, it's thermalized everywhere. So I'm actually working right now on looking at the HCM, HCO plus properties. Well, that's another talk for another day. Um, the other thing I've been thinking about is what's left over <coughs> when these things are, are done. And there's these nuclear star clusters that are often found in, in, in galaxies uh, with sizes of around tens to hundreds of parsecs. And it's not known where these guys come from. So uh, one of the things that I, I have a student that I to look into is what happens when these things are, are extinguished. Uh, what are the observational consequences of a nuclear starburst disk? It, it's up at redshift point eight. Uh, the infrared properties are complicated because uh, you have all the star formation, but you also have a lot of AGM heating. So rather than looking at the infrared, uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at the radio properties. So if you predict the infrared, because we know the dust temperature, and assume it follows the radio IR correlation, you can predict what the radio flux is going to be. Say at redshift point 0.8, uh, this, with this solid histogram is the uh, predicted radio flux of a nuclear starburst disk of those redshifts, and it's around 10 microjanskis which is interestingly just past the sensitivity of the most recent deep surveys, although the latest ones done by the EVLA will, will hit this. Uh, so the most common flux is about 10 to 30 microjanskis. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, a typical AGN radio flux from the nucleus is also around the same uh, region, that's the dashed histogram. So you're going to have to separate out the AGN radio from the star formation radio, but there are ways of doing that because of the brightness temperature and the spectral index. So we actually tried this a couple of years ago to see if you, you could do, find evidence for this radio emission. Uh, this was work led by my postdoc, Christy Pierce. Uh, we went to the Cosmos survey, we selected X-ray AGNs at redshift less than one. Almost all of them were undetected at the radio, but we stacked them in different uh, redshift and luminosity bins and corrected for the AGN nuclear emission. There's a correlation between the X-ray luminosity and the radio luminosity for radio quiet AGNs. You can subtract that off. If there's anything left over, we interpret that as star formation. And you get star formation rates left over in these stacks uh, that are in the right ballpark. You know, a few to 30 uh, solar masses per year. Now, of course, this could be, we don't know if it's nuclear or, or host galaxies, or probably a combination of the two, but at least it's in the right ballpark. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the parsec scale burst is not necessary to fuel the AGM. If that opacity never actually drops, then the star formation rate just sort of uh, drops slowly off its function radius, but you still can feel, feel the AGN. In this uh, example, the vertical structure would be unclear, and I have a graduate student starting this coming year who's going to simulate this more in two dimensions to try to solve the vertical structure. 
Um, here, here's a slide about molecular line properties. Basically, these things are expected to be almost completely molecular. The densities are so high. And we do predict very high J uh, transitions for them. Uh, so, in the last, how much time do I have? No time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, I'll go here. A lot of you have seen the last few slides before, so I, 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 will, I feel comfortable sticking. But basically, uh, a year ago we looked at whether or not uh, you could just me uh, measure or to account for the, all the AGNs we see in the x-rays with just mergers from what we think we understand about mergers. And the answer is we couldn't. You can do it at a high redshift, maybe around redshift 2, but there, the merger rate drops off much faster than the AGN that went up density rate. And so you need something else to make AGNs basically at redshifts less than about 1, which we call secularly dominated. And these are these obscure Seifert galaxies that make up the X-ray background. So here's the X-ray background. The blue lines, the, uh, the uh, obscured Seiferts, fueled by secular. The red line is the mergers. So the light integrated accretion light is dominated by secularly triggered AGNs. But the mass, this is the mass density in black holes, it's grown by uh, luminous accretion provided by major mergers. And so there's this interesting transition that we're uh, finding in AGM uh, evolution uh, that happens between about redshift 1 to redshift 2. In that you get, you go from a region up to high redshift where you have lots of galaxy mergers triggering in this rapid accretion, but then it transitions to a more leisurely, secularly uh, re regime of black hole. And it would be very interesting to, to study this transition more. So here are my conclusions, and I'll stop here. Thank you.